All right, so last time we started proving Mazur's theorems. Let me remind you what we're doing. So uh, n is greater than 7, not equal to 13 in prime. And we want to show that no elliptic curve. Over 2 has a rational point of order n. So we started proving this last time, and we got, let me just remind you where we were. So we picked a prime p, dividing the order of the difference of the cusps in j0n. So we showed that this was a non-trivial torsion point whose order divided n minus 1. So we can pick some prime dividing its order. And automatically that prime will be not equal to n. Uh, and then we need to find this a inside of t to be the p Eisenstein ideal. And it's generated, I mean, by definition, it's the ideal generated by p and tl minus l plus 1 for all l not equal to n. And then we let i be the intersection over the minimal ideals of p, minimal primes p, uh, which are contained in this maximum ideal i. We showed that this ideal, sorry, p are contained in a. We showed that a was a non-trivial maximum ideal. So this is the intersection. These primes cut out the irreducible components of spec t, and we're just taking the union of those components that contain this point. Uh, corresponding to A, and we define the Abelian variety A to be the quotient of J0n by I. And to prove the theorem, it's enough to show that this A has rank 0. So last time we treated the case uh, where all the uh, eigenforms of level n had rational coefficients. And in that case, the thing that was nice about that case, if you remember this drawing of spec t I put up, it had all these branches. And in general, if the coefficient fields are bigger than q, there could be some splitting at p. But that doesn't happen when the coefficient field is q. And in that case, uh, this variety a uh, satisfies this jhp condition all of its Jordan Holder constituents of the p-torsion are trivial or cyclotomic. But in general, that doesn't have to be the case because you could pick up components of spec t that kind of split over p and don't meet a. And so in the general situation that we're dealing with today, this thing won't satisfy that condition. And so this theorem b that we proved, that was criterion for rank 0, doesn't directly apply. OK, but the idea is that the proof basically goes through, and we're going to, I mean, what it will show is that if you take the mordell vague group of a, and kind of localize at this prime a, that that thing's finite. And then it's going to be an easy commutative algebra argument from there to get finiteness of a of q. All right, so that's the plan. So we're going to have to kind of redo the proof of theorem b, but in this situation. Uh, so we need to go back into the details of that argument. So let me remind you the setup. OK, so there's this, there was this notion of an admissible group admissible group scheme. So a group scheme over z or z1 over n is admissible if, all right, I'm maybe not going to write the whole thing. There's some technical conditions about it being finitely presented, finitely presented and separated. But the main points that you want is that away from, OK, so you should be thinking about like the p torsion in the Neron model of an abelian variety with good reduction away from n. So you want it to be finite and flat away from n. And then uh, you want it to be, you know, away from p, it should be a tau, because it's like the p torsion or something. Uh, but you can't say finite, because at n it might have bad reduction, but it's quasi-finite. So quasi-finite and a tau away from p. 
And then it also was supposed to have a filtration. So there exists a filtration with uh, successive quotients, either z mod p z or mu p. Uh, and this is supposed to exist over z join 1 over n. And so we proved a proposition, which was that uh, if g over z, so suppose we have g over z, so it, if this satisfies 1 and 2, and the condition jhp, so I, by that I mean it's Galois representation is just built out of trivial and cyclotomics, then it's admissible. In other words, you can transfer the condition about having such a filtration in the generic fiber to all of spec Z. And the way that that worked was by using Renault's theorem, at least when P was not 2, when P was 2, you know, this generalization due to Fontaine that we didn't really talk about. Okay? So we define some numerical invariance associated to an admissible group. All right, so first of all, we define L of G just to be the log base P of the order of G. And I'll use this notation for whatever P power group, just admissible ones. Uh, we defined delta of G to be the difference of L of GQ and L of GFN. Right, the point is that because G is not necessarily finite over Zn, the rank could drop when you specialize. So you can get some number here. And then alpha of G was the number of Z mod PZs in G, meaning when you do this filtration, you look at the quotients how many z my p's show up. Uh, and this is over z join 1 over n. And hi is the uh, log base p of the order of the FPPF cohomology group. We prove this inequality if G is admissible, then H1 minus H0 is less than or equal to delta minus alpha. Right? The way that we proved that was by showing that every admissible guy was built out of these four things, there was Z mod P, Z, and U P, and then their extensions by zero from when you invert N. And then we explicitly computed all the invariants in those cases and just checked. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a, at the generic point, it's just a finite group scheme. So it's just a few points. Okay. Oh, by the Galois representation, you mean just take the cube bar points. Yeah, that, right. Mm -hmm. I mean, all that we know about that Galois representation is that it has a filtration and the quotients are trivial or cyclotomic. Yeah. Okay. And th I mean, the point of this proposition is that that's basically if and only if in the yeah. presence of one and two. Yeah. Okay, so let me um, recall just briefly how the proof of theorem B worked. This criterion for rank zero. So we, the starting point is that we have an abelian variety over Q. It has a good reduction away from N. Uh, 
It has completely torque reduction at end. And its P torsion satisfies this JHP. These are the hypotheses, and the conclusion is that A of Q has rank zero. <coughs> okay, so the way that the proof of this worked is we took the Neron model. So it's P to the N torsion is an admissible group scheme. Uh, one and two follow easily from this. And to get three, we used this in that previous proposition. And then we computed delta and alpha of this thing. So we showed that delta of this guy was approximately equal to alpha. And we gave the result more precise than that. We computed them separately and found that they were approximately equal. And this implied that this H1 minus H0 is bounded as n goes to infinity. Because right, the difference is bounded by the difference of these two things, and they're about equal, the difference was bounded, actually. But this H0 itself, this is already bounded. Because it's just the P of A torsion in the Mordell of A group. So looks like the order of the P of the N torsion in here. By the Mordell of A theorem, this is a finitely generated group. So as you take P to the N torsion with N bigger and bigger, that stabilizes. It doesn't keep scrolling. Okay, so combined that shows that this guy here, the H1 is bounded. And then the point was that A of Q more or less injected into the inverse limit of these H1s. Okay, this statement wasn't exactly true. We, we were a little, we had to use the connected component of the identity and we have to worry about the prime to P part, but it's basically true and this inverse limit is finite because these groups are bounded order and so that shows that this is finite. Okay, so that was the idea of this proof. No, A of Q injects into here. I mean, this is the Coomer sequence, right? So you get for each n, this thing mod P to the n injects into the nth term. And then you take the inverse limit, and so it's like the p-adic completion injects. OK, so we want to carry out the same idea in the setting that we're currently in. And so it's not going to be true that this is admissible, but what we're going to do is take this and kind of localize at the ideal A. And that part will be admissible. And then we can compute delta and alpha of that part. And we'll find that this HPPF with A coefficients is finite. And that will tell us some A part of this is finite. Right? So that's the plan. Any questions? Okay, then we'll get started. So the first thing I want to prove is that if I take the so it's okay, so we have this fixed Abelian variety A now. That we, it was J zero N mod I J zero N, and A is going to be its neuron model. Alright, so the first thing that I want to show is that if you take its P to the N torsion and take its A part. So uh, by that I mean the localization at A. Uh, you can also think of it, so remember if you take the completion of the Hecke algebra at P, uh, this is the completion at this maximum ideal A times some other piece. This is a direct factor. So there's some idempotent that projects onto here, and this is just equal to that idempotent applied to the full P to the N torsion. So I want to say that this is admissible. Okay, so it's enough to show
that uh, the Galois representation associated to this, or this guy, satisfies, with an A there, satisfies this JHP. Oh, it's a max, I mean, this is a T module, and A is an ideal of T. So yeah, you can think of it as localizing or just applying this item potent of the algebra. I mean, th th this is killed by P, so the T module structure extends to the completion. Yeah. And that's kind of an important point. The, this item potent is not defined in T. You have to periodically complete to see it. And that's kind of the whole problem. And if it were defined in T, then you could do this quotient, I mean, A. I mean that, yeah. The problem is that, because it, it's not defined in T, well, whatever. I mean, when all these things were rational, when all the modular forms were rational, that basically made this item potent defined without completing, which is why we could do things easy before. OK. OK, so it's enough to show that this piece of the Galois representation satisfies this condition. All of its constituents are trivial or cyclotomic. OK, so here's the proof. OK, so first of all, um, so the p to the n torsion here is contained in some big enough power of uh, the m torsion here. Um, I mean, this thing here is the intersection of the p to the n torsion and the a infinity torsion. That's another way to do this localization thing. And so everything's killed by some power of a. Um, and then this thing is kind of built out of pieces that are just killed by a. So there's an exact sequence. The a torsion sits inside of the a to the m torsion. And then that maps to the a to the m minus 1 torsion, or maybe some number of copies of it. I mean, to, to get this map, pick generators for the ideal A, say that there are K generators, and then the case map is multiplication by that generator. The kernel of that is what's killed by A. The image is always killed by A to the M minus 1. Okay, so if we want to figure out what the constituents of this thing are, right, it's enough to know what the constituents of these pieces are, and by induction, it's enough to know what the constituents of this are. So it's enough to show that this first one satisfies JHP. And let me call that thing V. Okay, so I'm thinking of this as the Q-bar points, being a little sloppy of notation. So this is a Galois representation now. Okay, so <laughs> this this thing is a so v. Uh, so okay, this thing is p torsion because p is in the ideal a. So this is an fp vector space with a Galois action. We know that t l acts on v by just l plus one, right? Because the difference lies in a, and we're looking at the a torsion. So that's how t l acts on here. And then by Eichler Shimura, that tells us something about how Frobenius acts. So it says that if I look at the Frobenius at L, it satisfies this polynomial on V. Um, and for this, you need L not equal to, say, P and N. All right, so note that this polynomial factors, right? T squared minus L plus 1T plus L is equal to T minus L times T minus 1. And so this says that uh, the, general, the, the only generalized eigenvalues of Frobenius on this V are 1 and F. OK, and then that implies it. That implies what we want. So let me just prove that more generally.
So suppose that V is an FP representation of the Galois group, such that the generalized eigenvalues of Frobenius are 1 and L for all but finitely many, so for almost every L. Uh, then the constituents, the only constituents of V are trivial and superatomic. nice way to prove this is to introduce the space W, which is the direct sum of V and its dual twisted by 1. So this 1 here means tensor with cyclotomic. Okay, so if M is the matrix of Frobenius FL on V, then uh, the matrix of Frobenius here is transpose inverse M times L. So L times M transpose inverse is the matrix on V dual 1. So if you think of the Jordan normal form for this, I mean, we can go up to FP bar, say. The Jordan normal form of this, You know, you have some diagonal thing, and there's just ones and l's in the diagonal. And then when you take the transpose inverse, they'll just be ones and l inverses. And then you multiply by l, and it's just ones and inverses again. And all the ones have changed to l's, and all the l's have changed to ones. So the dimension of the one generalized eigenspace of fl on v is the dimension of the l generalized eigenspace. FL on V dual 1. And similarly, the dimension of the L generalized eigenspace here, the 1 generalized eigenspace there. So if we call this dimension K, then this dimension will be N minus K, where N is the dimension of V. So that means that the dimension of the one generalized eigenspace of Frobenius on W, well, it's the sum of the one here and the one here. So it's k plus n minus k. So that's just n. And similarly for the L, it's also n. So in other words, the character of W is equal to the character of n copies of trivial plus n copies of cyclotomic. Right? And so that implies that the semi-simplification of W is n trivials plus n cyclotomics. So the only constituents of W are trivial and cyclotomic, and so that says the same for V. Okay, so that finishes the proof that this A part of the P to the N torsion is admissible. All right, so now I want to start computing alpha. So I want to do alpha of this thing. So let me begin with a lemma. Suppose that I have a P divisible group over Q, say, with an action of this completed hack algebra. Such that its rational tape module, which I'll call VP, is free of rank 2 over that. Uh, 
well, that with P inverted. Uh, then, if I look at the P to the N portion in here, and look at L of it, so log base P of its order, uh, that's just equal to 2 times N times what I'll call D up to an arrow that's bounded. Or here D is the ZP rank of TA. This is pretty easy. So let T be the uh, integral tape module of this G. So then uh, L of G P to the N is just the length of T mod P to the N T. And now the hypothesis that this is free of rank two means that there exists some T prime inside T, a finite index which is free of rank two over the TA without P inverted. And so the length of this, this thing that we're interested in, T mod P to the NT, is equal to the length of this subguy, T prime mod P to the NT prime, up to an error that's constant, just depending on whatever that index is. And then this is just equal to that. Right, I mean, this is just two copies of TA, mod P to the N times two copies of TA. This is 2ND plus L1. All right. Okay, so here's the computation of alpha. N D plus L of one, or D is that's here. Okay, so remember alpha is counting the number of Z mod P's in the filtration. So just for notational simplicity in this proof, let's assume P is not equal to two. And so then alpha is just the number of Z mod P's in the Galois representation associated to A P to the N. Right, if P is 2, then mu P and Z mod P have the same Gal representation, so you can't say this. It doesn't actually make a difference in the proof, and I think this will just make it clearer. Okay, so recall that uh, the action of TL, it acts on the P to the N torsion in the Jacobian, and it's self adjoint with respect to the Vay pair. So that implies that the same is true for any element in the completed type algebra. All right, so if I let, let E be the idempotent in this T hat P, which projects onto T hat A. So in particular, this E is self-adjoint under the Bay pair. And since it's self-adjoint and idempotent, that implies that uh, if I look at E times J0n and 1 minus E, that these are orthogonal under the Bay pair. And since the Vey pairing is perfect, that implies that it restricts to a perfect pairing here.
All right, so last time we showed that if you look at the P infinity torsion in here and you take E, so that's just the A infinity torsion in here, that that mapped isomorphically to the same thing uh, for A. So by, this above, by the reasoning there, we see that uh, if I do a p to the n and localize at a, so that's just applying e to a p to the n, this is self-dual. So it's its own Cartier dual. On the other hand, uh, this thing is admissible, so it only has z mod p's and mu p's in it. Okay, so it's self-dual and it's made up of these things. So it has to have the same number of each, right? Otherwise it couldn't be self-dual. Okay, so this thing here, I mean, the same thing is true if I put p to the n. And this thing is self-dual. So that thing is as well. Okay, so that means that this alpha that we want is equal to one half of L of this guy. And now the lemma computes this and gives us what we want. So that to be a little more precise, if we let, uh, if I let G be the so if I take the p-infinity torsion in A and then localize it A, then if I take the p to the n torsion in G, it's equal to this. Right, because this lower subscript A just means apply the side and E. So this is a p-divisible group, and we know that this vp of G is just the A part of the vp of this. So it's... I mean, it's actually equal to VPJ0N localized today. And this is free of rank 2 over the heck algebra of A. Okay, so that tells us that the order of this thing, which is the order of that thing, I mean, the L's are equal to 2ND, where D is the rank of that. And so the alpha is equal to half that, which is nd, up to a bounded error. Okay? All right, so delta is a little more interesting. So I want to start with a, <laughs> a general result about computing delta. So suppose I have a p-divisible group over Qn. <coughs> and uh, I'll write V for its rational gate module. <coughs> and let script Gn be the maximal quasi-finite metal extension of the p to the n torsion over Zn. So we talked about this kind of process before. Um, P and N are not equal here, right? So I'm looking at P power groups and characteristic N. And we talked about there's this maximal extension, right? We talked about actually how all possible ways of extending it, right? Choosing an extension was the same as choosing a Galois stable submodule of the inertia invariance. And so the maximal one is when you take the full inertia invariance as the submodule. Okay, so the statement then is that if I do delta of this guy, right, so I'm looking at com comparing the difference in the generic fiber and the special fiber, how big they are, that it's just equal to the dimension of V minus the dimension of its inertia invariance times n up to an order that's bounded. Here, I is the inertia subgroup of Galois. Okay. 
All right, so let P be the integral state modulo over G. So over the generic fiber, this Gn is just the P to the n torsion in G. And so uh, its order, so the length of Gn over Qn, is just the length of P mod P to the n. And that's just equal to n times the dimension of P. Okay, so for the special fiber, so basically by definition, if I do the fn bar points, the special fiber, that's equal to the qn bar points with inertia invariance. And so that you can identify with p mod p to the np. Right, so the L here, the L of that in characteristic N is just the length of this module. And so if I think about this exact sequence, and I take invariance under inertia, then I get some exact sequence in cohomology, and it tells me that uh, I can take invariance first. But this maps into when I take invariance after doing this quotient. And then this snaps to H1 like this. And so the point is that this H1 is a finite, finitely generated ZP module, some finiteness of Galois cohomology. And so its P to the N torsion is bounded. So the length of the middle guy is the sum of the lengths of the outer guys. So it's the length of this. Up to some error that's bounded. And this is just equal to n times the dimension of the inertia invariance. This shows that to compute delta when I'm dealing with something coming from a p divisible group, I need to understand the inertia invariance in the tape module. So now I want to prove a general result about how that works in the kind of situation that we're in. Okay, so first, something a little easier. So suppose that b is an abelian variety over qn, and b is its narrow model over zn. Uh, then the rational tape module of B is just equal to, or sorry, of the special fiber is equal to the inertia invariance in the rational tape module of B. Okay, so the proof. So if I look at the P to the N torsion in B, that's an atal group scheme over Zn. And so every fn bar point will lift to a zn unramified point.
And the narrowed mapping property implies that every Qn unramified point of the generic fiber extends to a Zn unramified point. Okay, and so we've shown that if I take the n torsion and take its fn bar points, this is identified with just the qn unramified points of the generic fiber. And that's the inertia invariance of the qn bar points. And so now just take the inverse limit over it. So one more general lemma. This one's a little more interesting. So suppose I have an abelian variety over Qn, and it has completely torque reduction. And suppose that I have a sum end of its rational tape module. Sum end as a Galois representation. Then we know what the dimension of the inertia invariance is. It's just half the dimension of U. So we'll start by proving this for V. So the dimension of V is twice the dimension of V. So the inertia invariance of, of V by what we just proved is the rational Tate module of the special fiber of the narrow model. Now that thing's a torus. Right? This, is a, this thing here, its identity component is a torus. And the tape module of a torus, its dimension is just the dimension of the torus. So this has dimension, just the dimension of B. Right, so that proves the statement for V. So the dimension of VI is one half the dimension of V. So now I want to do it for a sum end. Right, so the potential problem is that you could have, possibly you could have some sum end, you know, that has, you know, maybe it splits into a sum of two things, and on one thing the inertia group has too much invariance, and on the other it has too few, right? That's what could happen. But that can't happen. And the basic reason is because uh, inertia is constrained to act in a particular way. So B has semi-stable reduction. I mean, it's stronger than that. It has completely toric reduction. And so that means that by this uh, growth and geek extension, growth and geek's extension of Neron on Shafarevich, that inertia acts unipotently. And in fact, there's a stronger result. So for any element of the inertia group, g minus 1 squared is 0.
and I'll come back to explain this at the end of the proof in our situation, but this is true in general. Okay, so if U is any just stable submodule, not necessarily a sum in, then, I mean, of course, this still holds. T minus 1 squared U is 0 for all gene inertia. And so that implies that the dimension of the G fixed element, the G fixed space, is at least one half the dimension of U. That's just true whenever you have an operator that squares to zero. And so now I want to extend this from this single element G to the full group. And the point is that the, the image of I is pro P. Right? Because uh, V is a QP vector space. And inertia is acting unipotently. So you can think of it as upper triangular matrices with one on the diagonal. And if you take that full group of such matrices, it has a filtration where the successive quotients are just QPs. So it's a pro-P group. So the image is pro-P. But this is, remember, this is the inertia of the QN field, right? So it has the tame part and then the wild part. And the wild part is pro-N. So since the image is pro-P, the wild part has to act by zero. And so that implies that the action factors through the tame quotient. And this is a pro-cyclic group. It's just the product of ZLs for L not equal to N. So it's Z hat with the one at N removed. OK, so if, I, if G is a pro-generator, G topologically generates, then the invariance under the full inertia group is just the invariance under this one element G. And so that gives me this inequality for the full inertia group. So now we're done, right? I mean, if V is, say, U1 plus U2, then the inertia invariance of V is U1i plus U2i. And we know that the dimension of VI is exactly one half the dimension of V. And we know that the dimension of the invariance of UI is greater than or equal to one half the dimension of UI. And so these inequalities are forced to be equalities. So I want to make two remarks. So the first is we only are going to need this for J0n, when B is J0n or quotient of J0n. So if B is J0n or a quotient of it, then we know something about the rational tape module. So VP of B decomposes into these VF lambdas. And each one of these is a two-dimensional vector space. So I mean, an element of inertia is acting unipotently on this. If, I mean, if you have a unipotent operator in a two-dimensional vector space, then g minus 1 squared is 0. Right? So for the things that we care about, we already know that g minus 1 squared is 0, assuming that g is unipotent. And the second remark is that uh, I mean these V F lambdas are some ends of this, you know, of J0, of the rational time module J0n. And we know that J0n has completely torque reduction. So th this lemma shows that uh, the inertia at n acts unipotently and non-trivially 
on these representations via fund. And this is some instance of what's called local to global compatibility in the Langlands program. Uh, so uh, let me just say a word about that, I guess. So if you start with a modular form F, right, you can ask, does there exist an associated Galois representation? And by associated, the most naive sense that you would mean is that for almost all primes L, the trace of Frobenius in this Galois representation is the AL of your form, right? And that would determine the representation by Chebotarov. And we know that's the, true in this instance. Uh, but in fact, so you could ask for something stronger. So there's what's called an automorphic representation associated to F. And you could ask that, you know, at, at every place, maybe away from P, if this is a p-adic representation, things are more complicated there. You could ask that the, uh, the representation of this uh, on the decomposition group at your prime L agrees under local Langlands with the L piece of the automorphic representation. And this is basically showing that. Uh, at n for these guys. All right, so now we want to compute delta. So, so why is it, can you say why it's true in general? That, why what's true in general? That g minus 1 squared will be 0. Oh, I, I don't know the proof offhand. Okay. I mean, Grothendi proves this in SGA when he's proving that. So this is something right special to abelian varieties, or is it even more general than that? Like it's special to abelian varieties, I think. Okay. Uh, I mean, in general, your thing is going to be unipotent, right? Yeah. This n operator. So something to do with the, the yeah, weight? Yeah, I think so. The... I'm not exactly sure what the general statement is, but it's probably yeah. something like that. All right, so here's the computation of delta. All right, I'm going to write script G for the uh, p-infinity torsion of A, the narrow model of A. And uh, I'll write g sub a for the image of it under the side impotent. And v is the rational k module of its generic fiber. And um, things agree. So v a is the image under e of v. And this is the rational k module of generic fiber of this guy. So uh, if you look at the p to the n torsion in G, so this is a group scheme over all of Z. We're only going to care about over Z of n, Z, Zn. And it's the, so this is the maximal Dow quasi finite extension of its generic fiber. And the reason for that is because of the Neron mapping property. Um, if you have some point of the generic fiber of this defined over some unramified extension of, of Qn, it's going to extend to a Zn point just by the Neron mapping property. So this fits into the situation of our first lemma. And so that shows us that the delta of this guy is the dimension of V minus the dimension of Vi times n plus o. Okay, so, oh, um, sorry, I wanted a's here. Okay, so th this is true. And so the same thing is true if I put an A here, because that's a sum end of this thing. This property passes the sum ends. So if I have an A here, then that this with A is here. All right, so uh, VA is a sum end of VP of A, or even VP 
P of J0n. And we know that J0n has completely toric reduction at n. So that's A or J0, whatever you want, it doesn't matter. A has completely toric reduction. So by what we just proved, we know the dimension of the inertia invariance. Okay, so this uh, says that our delta is just one half the dimension of V A times n plus of one. And now uh, this thing V A is free of rank two over T A hat. And so its dimension is going to be 2D. Oh, here's an A again. And this thing is just equal to the thing that we want. G A P to the N is equal to A P to the N. In both of these things, is just taking the p to the n torsion applying this item potent d. Okay, so that says that the delta of this guy is one half two d times n, which is n times d plus over. Are there any questions? Now we're going to prove that a piece of the Mordell Bay group is finite. So T acts by endomorphisms on A, so it acts on the Mordell Bay group. And I'm saying that if you complete the Mordell Bay group at the ideal A, you get a finite. And so this is just like the proof of, of theorem B. So we're just going to use the delta and alpha computations. So let me just go through the details. So A0 is the identity component of the NARAN model over Z. Uh, I'm going to let uh, script G sub N be the P to the N torsion in this thing, localized at A. So alpha of this thing, so what I was computing before, we didn't have the identity component there. But this alpha only depends on the special fiber at P. And A and A0 are the same thing away from N. So this thing is just equal to alpha of A P to the N plus A. And we know that's ND plus O of 1. And delta. Well, that will change. That's not quite equal to this. Because, I mean, right, remember, delta is computing the difference of the generic order and the order at n. And when I reduce mod n, this a might have components in the narrow model. Right? And so if I look at a versus a0, that could change how big this thing is. But it's only going to change it by the order of the component group, which is just in finite thing. So this is true of the finite pair. And so this is equal to nd plus of one still. OK, so uh, this tells us that h1 of gn minus h0 of gn is O of 1. It's the difference of delta. It's at most the difference of delta and alpha. Uh, but H0 is just contained in the, I mean, it's equal to this. Well, localized at A. So it's a sub of this, which is a sub of the P to the N torsion in this. And so that doesn't grow. So 
combining that with this, we get boundedness for H1. All right, so now we're going to do the Coomber sequence thing. So that's this exact sequence. A goes to, so A0 goes to A0 by multiplication by P of N, and the kernel is the P to the N torsion. And so we take cohomology of this, uh, FPPF cohomology over Z, and so we get A0 Z times Z mod P to the N uh, injects into H1 FPPF. All right, now we take the inverse limit over n. That preserves this injection. So I'm tensoring the zp now. And that injects into this inverse limit. Same thing. And so now I'm just going to hit this with e. That's going to, I mean, he's an item potent, so I'm just kind of taking a sum end of the whole situation. So I'm still getting an injection. And this, is, this here is the piatic completion of the z points of A0. So when I hit it with A, I'm, I mean, sorry, when I hit it with E, I'm just kind of taking the completion at A. So I get A0 of z tensored over T with T hat A. And that injects into the inverse limit of H1 FPPF. Z with G and coefficients. V just moves through everything because I'm taking a sum out. And E of this was GN. All right, so now the order of this is finite and is bounded as N grows. And so that tells us what we want. So this implies that A0Z tensor over T with T and hat is finite. And A zero Z is contained in A Z without the zero. And this is a finite inner containment. And this is just equal to A of Q. So that tells us what we want. Yeah. Yeah, that's the whole point. Yeah. I think we consider ourselves lucky. It was this whole, you know, theory of these admissible groups and working out what was going on. Yeah, I mean, if you remember, like, I mean, the boundedness here depended on, like, this H1 minus H0 is less than delta minus alpha. And I mean, for that inequality, we, like, just computed what happened with the basic admissible group schemes, which we only knew because of how constrict constrictive this condition is. So more generally, like that inequality is probably not true, and you probably know less about what you know groups would look like. And then it's also still delicate that delta and alpha are basically equal. It depends on a lot of things. All right, so now we want to finish up and deduce finiteness of A of Q from this completion at A. So the point is that a of Q is a T module, in fact, a T mod I module, right? Because we killed I to get A. And it's finitely generated, so it's finite rank over Z. And this, I mean, if you remember the picture of spec T, you know, spec T join I is some union of components, and it's basically defined by the fact that each of those components meets A. So you have this, you know, scheme, and when you're localizing this module at this point, which meets every component, you get something finite. And that just by commuter of algebra implies what you want. So let me give a little more details of that argument. So let's begin with this statement. So suppose that O is an order and a number ring, a number field. And 
A is the maximal ideal of O. And M is a finitely generated O module, such that its completion at A is finite. So I'll denote that like this. Uh, then M is finite. So I'll leave the details up to you, but I mean, the idea is that up to some kind of isogeny, M is free plus torsion. And when you localize at A, I mean, saying that when you localize at A, you get something finite means that that free part has to be zero. That's basically the idea. And this is kind of the point. I mean, if A is some prime of a P and P splits, I mean, there could be lots of different primes above there, but you just need to know fine, you know, when you localize it, just one of them, it's enough to know that you get something finite to get finiteness everywhere. Okay, so the same thing is true for things over the Heck algebra. So suppose that uh, M is a finitely generated T module, and that when you localize it, A, you get something finite. Then M is finite. Basically the same thing. So one way to say it is, oh sorry, <laughs> this is false, T mod I module. Okay, so the point is that if you look at T mod I, you can map that to the sum over all minimal primes of T, which are contained in A of T mod P. And this map has no kernel, it's injective, uh, because T mod i is reduced, and these are the minimal primes, and it has finite co-kernel. This is finite co-kernel and injective. And so if I tensor up with M, since M is a T mod i module, I just get M mapping to this. So the sum over the same P's of M mod P. And this is going to have finite kernel and co-kernel. And each of these T mod P's is an order in number field. And A it gives you a maximal ideal on each one of them. So since the completion of M is finite, so since M tends over T, T A hat is finite, the same is true for each of these M P's. So the previous lemma implies that they're finite. So that implies that M is finite. Oh, in the first line? I mean, if you tensor this with Q, then this becomes an isomorphism. Right, because I mean, when you tensor with Q, these become the maximal ideals of this heck algebra. And, I mean, it's just the sum of Qs, right? I mean, this T mod I is like, generically, it's a sum of number fields, not Qs, but number fields. And it's sitting inside there. I mean, you have like the sum of the maximal orders. And T is some finite index thing inside those. So it's a pretty easy ring for questions like this. Oh, sorry. I is the intersection of these P's, right? Okay, so this gives us what we want. Right, I mean, it just follows from the previous lemma and what we've proved about the localization of A being finite. All right, so that completes the proof of the theorem. Last time we showed that the two cusps map to different things in this A, and so by the criterion we gave for no n-torsion, it applies for this quotient. Any questions? 
All right, so we've completed all the hard work now. Uh, so there's still things left to get the complete proof. Right? We haven't excluded 13 torsion yet, and there is no 13 torsion. And I think I'll do that next time. So that's a paper of Mazur and Tate that I think preceded Mazur's paper by about five years. And then there's composite orders that we haven't excluded, right? Like we've shown that there's no uh, 11 torsion that we haven't, or sorry, I mean, there could be seven torsion, right? But you're, there's not supposed to be any 49 torsion. We haven't excluded that possibility. So we have to do that kind of thing as well.